Little Boy Crying by Mervyn Morris Your mouth contorting in brief spite and hurt, your laughter metamorphosed into howls, your frame so recently relaxed, now tight, with three-year-old frustration, your bright eyes swimming tears splashing your bare feet, you stand there angling for a moment's hint of guilt or sorrow, for the quick slap struck, the ogre towers above you, that grim giant, empty of feeling, a colossal cruel, soon victim of the tale's conclusion, dead at last. You hate him, you imagine chopping clean the tree he is scrambling down, or plotting deeper pits to trap him in. You cannot understand, not yet, the hurt your easy tears can scald him with, nor guess the wavering hidden behind that mask. This fierce man longs to lift you, curb your sadness with piggyback or bullfight, anything, but dare not ruin the lessons you should learn. You must not make a plaything of the rain. Form-wise, the poem is neither orderly nor overly messy. We see three stanzas of roughly equal length, 7-6-6. Six, but then there's a single line at the end that serves as a sort of conclusion. There is no discernible rhyming pattern, and no discernible meter, so let's consider this free verse. Well, let's get into the words. Your mouth contorting in brief spite and hurt. Your laughter metamorphosed into howls. We're greeted here by personification, metaphor, and most of all, ambiguity. On the literal level, we have a boy who has quickly shifted from laughing to crying. His mouth is contorted into a frown or pout, reflecting his feelings of spite and hurt. This quick change of emotions could be a reference to mental or psychological issues such as schizophrenia or bipolarism. However, since the behavior is typical of young children and the persona here is a little boy, we won't give too much credence to that possibility. Let's break down the poetic devices here. Personification. Line 1 is syntactically ambiguous. I have a whole video on ambiguity that is either coming soon or has already been posted, so I won't get too much into it here. For now, we just need to realize that there are multiple possible meanings within these lines. The mouth is contorting, but we don't know if it is the mouth itself or the boy that is feeling the spite and hurt. If the mouth has contorted on its own accord, feeling the spite and hurt, then it's a strange kind of personification. Let's look at how metaphor is used here. 1. Your mouth contorting. The boy's mouth is compared to a contortionist, one who is capable of twisting their body into unusual positions. 2. A contortionist, taken less literally, is also one who twists words and phrases. This adds a layer of disingenuousness and artfulness, uncandid emotive deception to the boy's crying. Even babies have been seen to pretend to cry, to get attention, candies or toys, so this isn't a stretch. 3. Your laughter metamorphosed into howls. This use of metamorphosed instead of the conventional changed forcefully ascribes animalistic qualities onto the boy. Plus, the use of howls instead of the more apt cries implies a beastly action. We will see if this animalification persists as we continue. Let's look at some diction. I am truly hoping not to find nearly as many sex references in this poem as we did in My Papa's Walls, but I get the feeling that mouth contorting in brief is trying to pull us in a very immoral direction. Your frame, so recently relaxed, now tight with three-year-old frustration. Here we see metaphor, sarcasm, ambiguity, a lot of elements are at play here. We can't make a habit of this, but this time we'll look at a line and three quarters, since the last phrase of the second line is starting a new idea. On the literal level, we continue to see the metamorphosis from happiness to sadness. First laughter turned to howls, and now the boy's relaxed frame and body has tightened. The tightened frame, both metaphorically and denotatively, could speak to the boy's newly perturbed frame of mind, though a bit dated frame can be used to mean frame of mind, such as to always be in a happy frame. Three-year-old frustration could easily mean one of two things. One, 
the frustration felt by three-year-olds, or two, frustration that is three years old. This presents us with another syntactic ambiguity. The first meaning is a little more convenient, as it gives us a clear figure of the boy's age. Regarding both meanings simultaneously would mean that the boy has been frustrated literally his entire life. Your bright eyes swimming tears, splashing your feet. Here a plethora of poetic devices are at work. We have metaphor, onomatopoeia, personification, ambiguity, hyperbole, and idiom, all squished into these couple of words. There's a double metaphor in bright eyes. Bright-eyed or shiny-eyed means full of youthful naivete. It also means vibrant and lively. This could speak to the boy's inexperience and childishness. After all, he's only three. Soon we'll see that the boy gets a slap and later we'll see why. The bright-eyedness of the boy might be what caused him to act dangerously or foolishly, causing the father to correct him with a slap. Bright-eyed is often used to refer to creatures of the night, again animalizing the boy. By extension, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed idiomatically refers to cats and it can also mean inexperienced, naive, and excited. So this single metaphor has within it two distinct references to animals. Now let's break apart some ambiguity. The entire first stanza is one long jumbled sentence. Looking at it as a whole, there are various syntactic ambiguities that make the verbness or nounness of some words debatable. Getting into and thoroughly explaining some examples of this would derail the poetic analysis and develop an extremely linguistic focus. So let's forego that. If it's something you're interested in, I can make a video that specifically deals with the ambiguity within this poem. Anyway, the ambiguity here makes for two more possible instances of personification. The first one is obvious, the tears are swimming. This would serve to paint the flowing of the boy's tears. The second possibility of personification forces us to consider swim a transitive verb. So the bright eyes become the subject of the tears. The eyes are swimming the tears. Since the aim of swimming is to navigate through a body of water, this could mean that the boy's eyes are trying to navigate or see through the tears. He is crying hard and so it becomes difficult for him to see clearly. Next, let's look at what I call a momentary hyperbole. It appears the tears are so much that they form a puddle beneath the boy in which his feet splash. This would be obviously hyperbolic. However, the hyperbole is dispelled at the end of the poem, as the last line suggests that the puddle has been formed instead by rain. And if you're counting devices here, we have onomatopoeia in splash, which is there perhaps to provide some audio imagery. You stand there angling for a moment's hint of guilt or sorrow for the quick slap struck. Here we have metaphor and sibilance. Have you ever been hit so hard and so fast that your mind needed a moment to process what had just transpired? This seems to be the boy's plight. He stands waiting for his mind to register the quick slap. He awaits guilt or sorrow, but for the moment he's dumbstruck, or well, struck dumb. Let's look at the metaphor in angling for a moment's hint. Building on the hydros imagery painted by swimming and splashing, the boy is compared to a fisherman who is now fishing for a hint of what had just happened. Now let's look at how alliteration comes into play. Serpents can strike with savage swiftness. You might hear the ringing hiss of the swift serpentine strike in all those S's I just used. While repeating a single consonant to create a desired effect is called alliteration, when that sound is S, whether caused by S's, C's or X's, it's called sibilance. The snake-like swiftness of the slap the boy suffered no sibilance intended, is reflected by the sounds in stand, moments, sorrow, slap, and struck. This sibilance also serves to sneakily continue to animalize the boy. There are three other ways in which the slap's swiftness and intensity are reflected. 1. The speaker does not tell of the action of the slap. Instead, only the boy's reaction to the slap is mentioned. In anime and even in some movies and shows, one excellent way to show speed is to not show an action that is done, but rather only the action's effect or a character's reaction to that action. Another way in which the words we see, well in this case the words we hear, mimic the slap's speed is in the shortness of the last three words, quick slap struck. 
All monosyllabic, these words just sound like fast linguistic jabs. And three, still looking at the last three words, we see not only a phonetic quickness, but also a phonetic power. These three words hit us hard with plosives. Plosives are those sounds that are made when we forcefully and quickly release air, such as p and b. Quick slap struck features three velar plosives and one bilabial plosive. But we won't go too much into the phonology of these words. Instead, let's continue. The ogre towers above you, that grim giant, empty of feeling, a colossal cruel. Here we have metaphor and hyperbole. Before we dig into these two lines, let's zoom out a little and recognize that this new stanza is written in an entirely new perspective from the last. In fact, we will soon see that each stanza has its own unique point of view. So far, we have been seeing the three-year-old just as the title predicts, as a little boy crying. Now watch how we move into a fantastical world, where the father is the big bad villain and where the boy must be the hero, the dragon slayer. The stanza long metaphor begins. The father is called a giant and an ogre, both of which are monstrous and usually considered evil. Now we see the world through the eyes of a three-year-old who has watched too many cartoons or has been read too many fairy tales. The purpose of this metaphor is clear. Like an ogre or giant, the father is, from the boy's perspective, a big bully whose only aim is to make the lives of little boys miserable. Hyperbole is also obvious here and amplifies the metaphor's effect. The overwhelming size of the father is increasingly exaggerated. These two lines give us three stages. First, he is a towering ogre. Then, he is a grim giant. Finally, he is a colossal cruel. At the final stage of this triple-tiered hyperbole, the father gets called a colossal cruel. Cruel is an adjective forced into nounship to make a point. This father, in the boy's eyes, in this moment when the slap has been registered, is the definition, the embodiment and incarnation of cruelty. Is this really how kids view their parents in a moment of punishment? Not only is the father a colossal cruel, but he is grim and empty of feeling. He is unremorseful, unfeeling. Within him is no love. Soon the victim of the tale's conclusion, dead at last. Here the boy imagines that in the end, the giant is defeated, killed. There are some interesting dynamics in perspective here. The boy breaks the fourth wall with the tale's conclusion. This could mean one or more of a few things. One, he's aware that the giant's defeat is only fictional. Two, he's an adult reminiscing. And even though he remembers his boyish imagination and how he used to hate his father while being punished, adulthood has clarified the reality for him. In any case, we see the dichotomy between living within the fiction and standing in reality and seeing the fiction for what it is, a tale. You hate him. You imagine chopping clean the tree he's crumbling down, or plotting deeper pits to trap him in. Here, the boy reflects on the hatred he has for his father, and on how badly he wants to kill him. In his fantastical battle, the tables are turned, and the great big giant is the one scrambling, running for his life. You cannot understand, not yet, the hurt your easy tears can scald him with, nor guess the wavering hidden behind the mask. Here we see metaphor and dramatic irony. Alas, the third stanza is a quick wakefulness from this heroic dream. The tone shifts from passionate hate to somewhere between patronization and sympathetic understanding. We have a new perspective. We, the readers, are shown that the father is far from empty of feeling. In fact, he is deeply wounded by the boy's tears, and this external toughness is just a mask that he wears to hide his wavering. He feels forced to apply tough love, even though it's painfully difficult for him. The slap that he gave the boy seemed to have hurt him, the slapper, more than it had hurt the slappy. Parents may be able to relate to this internal conflict. While we, the audience, are made aware of the father's true feelings, the three-year-old boy remains oblivious. This is the classic case of dramatic irony. Now let's look at two metaphors here. One, the hurt your easy tears scald him with. The water references continue for some reason. Here, the boy's tears are hot water that burns the father. 
Maybe under that mask of his is a face full of scars. The second metaphor is the mask, which symbolizes the tough exterior that the father shows when disciplining his son. The fierce man longs to lift you, curb your sadness with piggyback or bullfight, anything, but dare not ruin the lessons you should learn. Without context, it would appear ironic that this fierce man longs to play with his child, but by now we understand that this fierceness is only a facade that has shaped the boy's perspective. These lines show us the true desires and feelings of the father. He wishes he could do all of these fun little things with his son, but he feels compelled to be strict for the boy's own good. And finally, you must not make a plaything of the rain. Here we see why the boy was slapped by his father. It was for playing in the rain. This line acts as an answer, a conclusion, and it feels almost anticlimactic. Now that we see what all this fuss and emotional roller coasting was about. The boy was playing in the rain and needed to be taught a lesson. All of the images that pointed to water have culminated into this final scene. You must not make a plaything of the rain. And as always, thanks for watching.